molecular systems. And as I mentioned, my main topic is going to be electrostatic interactions and the development of constant pH simulation methods. So I start now moving uh, into this direction. Uh, essentially, we already have seen this picture before where in proteins or any biological systems, charges can be both in the molecule or in the solvent. This morning, you had all the discussion about Poisson Boltzmann that essentially we were talking about the same picture all the time. So this is the picture that I would like to have you in mind during these next uh, hours that we're going to be discussing electrostatic interactions. As I have done for the first set, I mean the first talk, and I'm going to do this for the next three, uh, three lectures, uh, I think it's important for you to know a little bit about the classical material, the classical books that you might be reading if you'd like to go deep in the subject. So I'm making a list here, and since this slide is going to be available to you through the server, uh, the ICTP server, I don't think I need the time for you to copy right now, but you have this information there, and you are welcome uh, to make me questions if you, have something, if you need something more specific. As I did also uh, yesterday, uh, during my presentation, I'm also going to highlight other, other texts that might be used for some specific points for you. Okay. Yes? Yes. Uh, but is it feasible to begin from start, to everything and... It depends what you like to do. I mean, it depends what kind of level of model that you're going to work. For instance, you are not going to invent things that people have been investing years and years of development. Uh, for, let's say, for simpler systems or for some specific tasks, of course, it's sometimes, very often it's needed for you to do uh, your own codes or modify available codes. But for... Uh, let's say, great part of the users, they're just going to download, and if they learn what's the meaning of the physical quantity they're going to be dealing with and learn how to decide if it's convergence, if you are getting really a proper sampling, this kind of uh, physical intuition, you are already good. So everything depends what you like to do in this field. I mean, it's, uh, there are lots of possibilities. Uh, for, let's say, for several things that I'm going to show you here, we have a developing in-house softwares. So we have spent some time thinking about the algorithms, making the implementation, debugging, tests, these kind of things. But for other things, I mean, there is no need. Uh, example, for a molecular dynamics package, it's easier to just look and see the ones that are available and start working with one that is available. Okay, unless you'd like, for like, like say you'd like to change, for instance, the integration algorithm for some specific reason. Okay. Okay, so uh, I will start, I mean, this is what I'm going to do in this set of the three lectures. The division between the topics might vary, I mean, it depends how, how far I can go, uh, look into the time here and based on, on the kind of questions. But the idea is like, I, I'm going to start with a little bit of the motivation, very basic first year physical chemistry, just to, to provide us the background that I'm going to use here later in the constant pH methods. Uh, describe a little bit how we can measure electrostatic properties, the, the classical and I would say the landmark work of Tumford and Kirkwood, some basic ideas that already Eduardo covered this morning, but trying to look a little bit from more the physical side, uh, how we have developed the constant pH methods and others that are available in the literature. And especially I think using these methods, what I think is going to be especially more interesting for people that are dealing with the physics is, is this peculiar behavior that you can have uh, between like charged objects, they can attract each other and we can explore this kind of physics that happens when you have two macromolecules that they carry the same net charge and they do attract each other. So this is something that I, I would like to show here and if the time permits, I'm going to complete with more examples. If not, during my working group sections, this is something that I can do I and mean, we can continue giving you examples about the, uh, these different applications of electrostatic interactions. Okay, let's start with the first three points at least, and then we go to the next ones. Motivation, I mean, we already have been discussing electrostatic interactions. You can see that was a talk in the morning. Uh, you can see that yesterday when Roth was, was describing here the Brownian motion, he, he used a charge of the object. And we know that this is somehow is important. Actually, if you go back to the Schrodinger equation, this is really the main gradient. You put there Coulomb interactions. So even uh, we, when you think about the quantum world, you are going somehow to think about charges. But 
when we look at the interactions between buddies that are a little bit bigger, like macromolecular buddies or macromolecules, we know that there are different sets of interactions, and depend how I put my zoom, I can classify these in different ways. When you were working more on the colloidal-like domain, I mean, following the semi-structure that, that Eduardo used this morning, essentially we are going to write the things like this. I mean, we have uh, the electronic repulsion. I mean, just think about the Pauli exclusion, uh, exclusion principle. You cannot overlap the, let uh, the lateral crowds. You can have a charge transfer. You can have the different kind of multiple interactions, even the direct ones and the induced ones, and you can have the dispersion interactions. This is, let's say, the basic and the very classical. Often, the word electrostatic interactions can also means, can, can have different meanings. I mean, when people sometimes they say electrostatic interactions, they are really talking about one specific part of electrostatic interactions that it's inside this group here of multipolo that's charge-charge interactions or sometimes charge-dipole interactions. That's usually what people uh, can have in mind when you talk about electrostatic interactions. But I'd like to remember you that this is context dependent. So sometimes people can look at you most of the things that uh, you can see in this slide, and they are also talking about electrostatic interactions. So we have to be careful, and I will try to specify this, what I'm talking about all the time, to avoid this kind of confusion due to the names. Uh, as I said, motivation. Well, it's pretty easy nowadays to explain the importance of electrostatic interactions. And I can just go through slides or papers from people that got the Nobel Prize. I can, get, I can take, for instance, this paper in science uh, from Perut, he got the Nobel Prize in 62, and he writes a specific paper on science about electrostatic effects in proteins. And the very beginning of the paper, he's going to say that electrostatic effects dominate many aspects of a protein behavior. And you can see that in the paper, he's going to list different examples. Uh, the structure of the protein, the conformational changes, folding, hydration, catalysis, and interactions. So this is what people know and have been uh, publishing about many, many, uh, in during, uh, I would say, the last 50 years at least. But you have like classical papers like this one that's going to sell, to sell the, the, the importance of electrostatic interactions. I could continue, as I said, just, go, just talking about people that got Nobel Prize. This is actually the lecture that Ariel Warshaw gave when he got uh, the, the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, and you can see that he was described the structure function relationship, and in his talk, he was saying that the problem is mainly electrostatics. Another slide from Maria Warshaw, you can see that the secret of enzyme catalysis is electrostatic reorganization. So this key word is going to appear in many works, and it's going to be, uh, I mean, pretty much good for us to sell what's important. But let me try to give you some more practical examples and more basic examples that you can even find in ordinary physical chemistry or biophysical books. Uh, here is an example of one protein that's very similar. You have this CRABP1, and the biological function of this protein is to transport, to carry vitamin A. Here you can see the vitamin A. And there are two versions of these proteins. Two different, they are doing different mutations. One is, the, let's say, CABP1, and the other is two. One has a biological function. The other has not. If you superimpose the structure, you can see that there, there are just a small difference here, and essentially they are on the top of each other. So in terms of their 3G structure, they are pretty much similar to each other. But when you do the, the difference between the electrostatic map you can see that there is an area here that becomes much more negatively charged. So although they have these structural similarities, there are lots of differences when you are talking about electrostatic mappings, I mean, the map of electro electrostatic potentials. And actually, this is one use of electrostatics. I mean, one thing that people usually do is to get a structure in a protein data bank using the data banks that Chuck mentioned to you, one of the, one of, of the the ones that appeared there was a protein at the bank. You take the structure, you do electrostatic calculation, and you can map the electrostatic potential. And in some way, analyzing this map, you have information about what kind of molecules could bind in different parts of your surface. This is like, say, the very basic thing that you can do when you start studying a new protein, for instance. I can identify potential areas to bind, for instance, a positively charged molecule like this. So it's already one example. 
Uh, another classical example, and this is used, uh, usually is used when you are trying to teach students chemical equilibrium. This is, a, let's say, a good example of applications, why it's important to study chemical equilibrium. We can take, for instance, a molecule that has to be, uh, to go inside a membrane, so it has to pass this barrier here. So very often, you need this molecule to be uncharged here, and then to form a complex, you need something that's going to interact, so you need to be charged. And what's going to control this charge process is going to be pH and the, the, the environment solution. So under this pH condition, you need to be sure that your molecule is going to be uncharged. And under this condition, you need to make sure that it's going to be charged. So another example, how charge can play a role. And suppose that this can be a local anesthetic, for instance. You would like this to be very efficient because if you were putting your skin, you don't like to stop the heart of the patient. So also, when you think about applications, you have to be careful because uh, you would like things to really work when they are supposed to work and don't work when they're not supposed to work. Well, I already mentioned these things. I mean, that you can look into the surface of the protein map and electrostatic potential. This is one of the, the uses. Another thing that you can do is to map uh, the, the lines here, the field lines, in order to, to get an information how they are going to approach each other. Because there are two steps. I mean, you need, first of all, to have some kind of interaction that's going to bring the two together, and then they are going to stay there. So you can see the representation of these two things. And that's, as I said, the very basic use of electrostatic interactions. And at the same time, I'm trying to illustrate problems like the CROBP1 and 2, where the difference in electrostatic potentials can really have a contribution or an impact in the biological function. OK, I'm not going to continue with lots of examples. I mean, you probably are going to pick up uh, or, or at least listen to different uh, examples during the next talks from different people. Uh, but let me go back to the basic physical chemistry that I will need this uh, for the constant pH methods. And at the same time, to explain how the charges appear in a protein. So, Normally, when you talk about interactions, as I said, you can have different names. And here, I'm starting to focus a little bit more on the Coulomb law that you can apply to biological system. So most of the kids, when they are 10, 12 years old, they start to learn about this name. That's the physics that I'm doing here. So sorry, if you came to an advanced school, I have to offer you something very basic. But you're going to be surprised at the end how this basic and, let's say, very primitive physics end up uh, into difficult to, or not difficult, it, it ended up uh, dealing with difficult problems and is able to solve this very complex problem. So we come back to this later, okay? Uh, let's look a little bit to, the, to the, the, the composition of the protein. So proteins are made up of amino acids. And if you take one amino acid, a general one here, I mean, the side chain can be different. But in general, if I just take a single and isolated amino acid, we can have an amino group that can be protonated and we can have the carboxyl group that can lose one proton. So essentially, I already have a molecule. I mean, even if I forget about the side chain, that can have a group that can be positively charged, and then I have another group that can be negatively charged. And this is controlled by pH. So the charge, as you can see here, can vary between plus one in units, elementary units of charge, to zero, and for other groups, from zero to minus one. So we already can see that it's pretty easy to produce charge in biological systems. One single amino acid is enough to change its charge from minus one to plus one, depending on the pH condition. And the picture can be a little bit more complicated because you have the side chain that can depend on the group that you have there, the chemical group that you have there. You can also have some titrable groups, and eventually it can also be protonated or deprotonated. Okay? So how do we quantify such things? If I go to the physical chemistry books, I'm going to find this equation. Well, the dissociation of a weak acid, I can write the acid, the proton, and the associate base there. And for process like this, we learn how to calculate the equilibrium constant based on the activities. Activities here of the products and for the reactions. Okay, that's very basic. What I'd like just to point out here is that often we use the chemical or the or chemical or equilibrium constant. And, but we don't make a difference between two kinds of constants that we can have. One, that's always true, that's the thermodynamic really quantity, that's based on the activities. And the other, that's already an approximation that's valid for an ideal system that is based on the concentrations. 
So we already have a difference here that very often is neglecting most of the papers. We just write equilibrium constants, point. But here is what we have, the stoichiometric one and the thermodynamic one. And this is going to play a role when I'm going to develop the constant pH methods. So keep this in mind, okay? I'm using here A for activities and this little s here for the stoichiometric constants. Okay, let's continue. Often, what we'd like to measure, as I showed yesterday, is things related to free energies. So often, instead of working with constants, we work with pKs of these constants. There are two reasons. One is that working a logarithmic scale, my numbers became smaller. So it becomes easier to do with these numbers. Is that's the reason I do have the pH in the logarithmic scale. Another reason is like, as you can see, if I start defining something like the pKa as the logarithm of the constant that I had, I can see that if this goes up, this goes down. But if I write this using the definition in terms of free energy, and I have here, instead of k, I put p, I put the log, I can see that when this one goes up, this one goes also up. So I put them in the same direction. So it becomes easily to identify that a change in the pKa is the same change in the free energy despite a constant. So that's another way. I mean, I can look in the biochemistry, look into the, to the change in the free energy, but I can also look in change in the pKa's, and they are going to be equivalent despite a constant. So if delta pKa is positive, it means that the delta G is positive, and vice versa. Uh, another practical thing here, that especially for this equation that we have written, I mean, so this is a specific case of a chemical equilibrium, uh, what we have here is that the pKa is a tendency of a group to give up a proton. So I have a, I'm measuring how easy a group can lose a proton and then change the charge. The basic definition of pH, the use, the use of this logarithm scale, you can find in this classical paper here from Sorensen. It's a Danish guy that he's published a paper in 1909 where he just introduced this notation between using constants. And all the time that uh, I, I have this slide, I would like to remember, remind you that especially in Scandinavia, so Rafi can here help me to explain why, but very often people were dealing with production of beer. And they needed to know very well and to control very well the pH of the system. So you can see that most of the, let's say, the basis or the foundations of this part of the chemistry or physical chemistry is directly related to Scandinavian people. And in fact, this work was supported by Kausberg Brewery. They had a research lab. They, I don't know if they still are running the lab, but anyway, they used to have a lab and even a journal where most of the results that you can see, and I'm going to show you a little bit more, uh, came from the source. Anyway, I'm not, I have nothing to do with Kausberg. I don't get anything to make the commercial. It's just, it's just something that I would like to add as a kind of a curiosity. OK, so let me go back to what I just described between how we can change charges. Here, you can see the change from plus 1 to minus 1. And I would like to stress a little bit this to make a little bit clear what comes next. So if I have an amino acid in this condition, what's the meaning? If I'm working in a, in a system where the solution is very rich in proton. So I have so much proton, so many, so many proton particles in the solution that it's pretty easy for the protons to jump over the protein. So in this condition, or under this condition, what we have is that the amino group is going to be easily protonated, and the carboxyl group is also going to be protonated. So in this condition, I have zero in this side, and I have plus one there. So plus one and zero makes a net charge of plus one my molecule. When I start increasing pH, what I'm doing is reduce, I'm decreasing the amount of a proton that's available. And at some point, we, I start to miss a little bit of protons in the solution, and the proton that was here in the carboxyl group is going to say, well, I prefer to go to the solution. So when the proton that was there goes to the solution, this chemical group now becomes deprotonated. So I, I got a minus charge there. So this part becomes negatively charged, but I still keep the positive one there. Keep it going in this process. I mean, increasing pH, it means that I'm going to a regime that I'm start lacking protons in the solution. So under this condition, the proton that was happy to stay here in this amino group decide, okay, now it's my turn to go out to the solution. So this is the process that I was 
comment in a more, let's say, detailed version. Okay? Uh, when you look into the 10, let's say, classical or canonical amino acids, you can see that some groups, like arginines, for instance, they have also a tendency for the side chain to lose one proton, so they can be, the charge can vary between zero to plus one. You have also other groups, like aspartic acid here, for instance, that they can ha get or lose one proton, so the charge can vary from minus one to zero, plus the change that I already were talking about between the amino and the carboxyl group. So when you talk about proteins, you can clearly see that there are groups that can also interfere in this process. So far, I'm talking about one single amino acid. In real life, when I make a protein, the peptide chain, peptide link, is going to make this guy to disappear. So I'm going to have one N terminal, one C terminal, and the, the charge that can be left are the ones that come from the side groups. Uh, cysteines, when they make sulfur bridge, they cannot lose the proton, but when they are free, they can also lose the proton. So it's all something to keep in mind. Often, the list of the groups that we are going to use for chemical equilibrium and the, 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 their PKAs are the ones that I'm showing in this guide. Remember that this one is only when it's not involved in sulfur bridge. And again, Lindstrom Lung is the guy that was measuring this. He was the director of Kausberg, and he was measuring this kind of chemical equilibrium properties. Another name that's very strong in this field, and I have also a phrase for this, everything I'd like to know about proteins, read the book from Kirkwood. He has a book called Proteins. And every time that you think you have done something totally new, you go there and you find that he has already done. Uh, he died when he was 57 years old. So probably he still have jobs because he died very earlier. Otherwise, he, has, he probably had solved all the problems. Anyway, it's also a good name for you to keep in mind, Kirkwood. And he, he has done a very great work in statistical mechanics on proteins. So, and he's the one that has started actually the quantification of these things, collecting results, of course, from people that came before him, but in a, in a kind of more organized version at least. Again, Kausberg. Okay, when I start combining these amino acids and forming proteins, we can calculate things, and so I start now to look how we are going to, to make the calculation in an ideal condition. Uh, so if I take just, again, one single amino acid, I can calculate what we call the degree of ionization using this equation. Essentially, I have the pKa of the group, so I can take one of, for instance, the experimental measurements here, depending on the group that I'm looking, I can specify the solution PA that I would like to measure, and I can define the degree of ionization. Using the degree of ionization, depending if the group is basic or acid, I can calculate the charge of this group. And a typical titration plot looks like, like this. You have the charge, a measurement of the charge, and you have pH. And in the condition where half of you uh, your system is halfly charged, you define for, for, for this pH, you call this pKa, or pKa zero, if you are talking about ideal conditions. Okay, that's really, again, the basics. Of course, here I'm varying between zero to minus one, because I, I'm assuming uh, amino acids like an aspartic acid. But it could be go the opposite way. It could be between plus one to zero, if it was like arginine. So you can take this in, more, in absolute numbers, just to make it in a, to more general. But this is not all the reality. If you look in the table that I showed before, that maybe here it's going to be easier, uh, depend on the size of the chain. When you measure these in experiments, you can see that the number is not identical. So if I compare, for instance, these two amino acids, they have at the end here the same group that can titrate. But in the case of the aspartic acid, I have one carbon that separates this group from the center of the alpha carbon. And here I have two groups, right? So I have introduced an extra carbon there with two hydrogens. So I'm putting this a little bit far away from the initial situation. And this is enough to change the equilibrium constant. In this case, I have four, and here I have 4.5. So this starts to tell you that when we go to the structures of proteins, the ideal numbers that I was, I was showing you, 
they are not going to be exactly at once. So the environment is going to affect your numbers. And you can easily see this here, just look at this number. Not only that, I mean, I can also compare here what's going to be the pKa of the carboxyl group. Here's two, here's 2.1, because now I have put this charge a little bit further. So how far the charges are, are definitely going to affect the measurements of your pKa's. And this has to be taken into account. So all the time that I'm saying that I'm working in ideal conditions, I'm neglecting this phenomena. All the time that I try to quantify such things in a real biological system using any kind of technique that I might be able to use, I'm trying to incorporate what we call the neighborhood effect. And that's what I try to illustrate in these slides. So you already know that the pKa's can be affected by the neighbor charges. And in fact, when you try to, to plot here the titration plots and you try to analyze different residues, different amino acids that are in different positions, I mean, I just took here all the aspects that we have for this protein. You can see that the titration plots can in fact be very much different from the ideal condition. This green plot here is the only case for this ASP53 where the pKa that we found in the, this experiment was very close to the ideal conditions. All the others, all the others, they were shifted. And understanding me how much they were shifted and what's the relation with the structure is telling you something about both functions and what about the conformation of the protein and this kind of thing. So it's really something for us important. Sometimes we'd like to measure how this is going to be shifted when you have a binding or a complexation in the system. So again, I can go back to what Chuck was using in his presentation yesterday, that you can measure the change in MR noise. I can do here the change in the PKAs and try to get some information about what process is happening in the, really, the microscope level, okay? Uh, I was talking about single amino acids. If you add up the contributions for all the amino acids, we can make a titration plot for the whole protein. So essentially, you take the contributions as I described before, and you add up all the groups that can titrate, and you see if it's positive or negative charge, depending on the condition that you are, and depending on the number of different amino acids that you have in your system. Here I have an example of a titration plot for two proteins, uh, lysozyme and alpha-lactobumin. They are the, from same evolution, so one is the ancestral of the other. And you can see what you can get from this kind of ideal behavior. And you, you can also see the solid line here as the result that you get if you do the proper math, taking account the neighborhood effect. So here, if I only use the linear sequence, that's my result. When I put into account the 3D structure in this neighbor effect, I get this plot. But surprise enough, the isolatic point, the PI, happens to be very similar. So when we decrease the charges, or I'm not showing here, but I'm going to show you later, when you increase the salt concentration that you screen out the interactions, these two plots, they tend to come very close to each other. So that's also something good to me. If you'd like to work in the ideal condition, uh, you can just put salt in the system, so you kill part of the, the, the repulsion attraction, and you end up just looking to the ideal behavior. Okay? But it's interesting to know these kind of things. Uh, in fact, there is even a paper where they were quantifying and showing for different proteins that if you calculate the ideal plot or you measure the isolatic point in experiments, they more or less correlate to each other. So to predict the isolatic point, it's not a difficult task. You can, of course, improve your precision, playing a little bit uh, with the technique, but at the end, you can more or less guess just knowing the linear sequence, the number of different titrable groups that you have in that particular system. Another curiosity that uh, you might have here, I have a comparison between the ideal solution for different proteins. Sorry, it's in Portuguese. I forgot to translate this one. But anyway, uh, you have different proteins here. You have the result that you got using these analytical equations that you saw in the previous slides. And here result that I got doing Poisson-Boltzmann uh, calculations. And here you have the experimental data. You can see that for some system, of course, Poisson-Boltzmann is a little bit better than what you can get in ideal. But they are not really different, too much different. In some cases, we even got the same results for the three techniques. 
Okay? In other case, there is a kind of a small, let's say, there's a tendency in one direction, a tendency in another direction. So you can see that what they, they, they were doing here for this kind of ideal measurements, it's also more or less what you can get even for more sophisticated approaches. I could do something similar with Monte Carlo, with other things, and we're going to end up in the same conclusions. Okay, I mentioned that the neighborhood has an effect, but let me start talking now about how these things are going to control your system, or what's going to be the effect of the pH. So, of course, if I change the charge, I'm going to change interactions. And this is just a cartoon to try to show you that automatically you are going to af affect your uh, conformation. So if I change the charge here, and for instance, this one is going to be repuls repulsive, if I make this guy negative, eventually I start to have an attraction here, and my protein is going to be to try to fold. If I put, suppose that everybody here was positively charged, there would be a tendency for this to be like a straight polymer. Okay, so you can see that the conformational change can be affected because I'm able to use a pH to change this specific charge that I have in my polypeptide chain. Uh, another thing that's even more important, pH can control functions. And now I'm taking data from a biochemical book. So I went to talk with Chuck, for instance, I got his slides, and you can see that the function of different enzymes is dependent of the pH, and it should be. If the pH is able to control interactions, of course pH is going to control the biological function. So it's more or less obvious, I would say, okay? Okay, I can summarize everything here uh, where you can see that the charge essentially depends on the pKa of the group, so you put the chemistry there, and it depends also on the condition that you are. Uh, you can see that process, even like the association of the proteins, and you can find these many applications, macroencapsulation, the production of milk, uh, soft drinks, even beer that was described this morning. In all this process, you might have association of the proteins or you'd like to prevent association, depending on what's your application. But one thing that's important that most of the time, this is coupled to the denaturation. And as I showed, if the pH is able to control the conformation, Eventually, depending on the pH condition, you are going to expose a lot of hydrophobic interactions. I mean, the hydrophobic amino acids. That's going to give rise to more attraction between the proteins that are trying in some way to prevent this to happen. So they try, uh, when, when I open a protein, I'm going to open an area that's very much hydrophobic. There's another protein here that's also very much hydrophobic. They are going to try to compact, to, to, to come together. So you also increase association. Salt is going to play a significant role, and of course, temperature as well. Typical things that people would like to do in, when, I, when I'm talking about this kind of application, is like in this example here for whey proteins, is to try to quantify in which conditions they are going to aggregate. These proteins are very much used in soft drinks. And when you take a soft drink, if I take a bottle of anything, I would like to see a kind of a transparency liquid, I wouldn't like to see something with small particles doing their brownie motion that's going to look like a little bit dirty, right? So what people usually try is to find the optimal conditions where these particles, they are there, but they don't aggregate. So they need to control in which pH conditions they, they are not going to aggregate. And that's one example of things that usually people do in this field. So as you can see, I'm mean, trying to go to this basic side. At the same time, I try to, to show you links between applications and to, make you, to help you to make the connections between the two sides. That's at the end just one. So this is a typical uh, cartoon uh, about what's electrostatic interactions in proteins. You, as you can see, charges can come up, can, can, be changing, can, can be changed, and can appear in your polypeptide chain, but it can also be in the solution due to the electrolyte solution. You also have water that has a dipole moment, so you can also have interaction with water, these kind of things, and amino acids that typically can, can interact more effectively because they also have titrable groups that are the source of these charges. Is it clear up to this point? Okay. Uh, well, I already have mentioned this, uh, that we have this model, and this is a just example of experimental data that you can plug to do this kind of calculations and do the analytical one. But when I say model, we start to have a situation. I mean, this is one example of experimental data. But if you look, for instance, in one classical paper, this is a, a, a paper from Nozagua, Nozaki, uh, from the 60, 62, 64, something like this where 
for different titrable groups, they were measure the titration and they were measured just under different conditions. You can see that they start having different numbers. And we are talking about something that's in logarithm units. So a small difference here is a little bit bigger than what we can expect because we have a different scale. So why this is happening? Well, there are different reasons. One is, of course, anything that can affect the charge, charge, in or in general electrostatic interactions can have a contribution in your chemical equilibrium. That's essentially what you can see when I put salts. I start to decrease the effect of the interactions. Okay? But uh, on the other hand, if I do the measurements using different peptides, because this is something that I didn't mention to you, it's very hard to have the isolated groups. So typically what the people do is they build very short peptides, tetrapeptides, pentapeptides, where they put chemicals between them, like they put uh, alanine, for instance, to make a peptide. And depending on the size of these peptides, we, you can guess that you're going to have an effect. I mean, just to go back to my example, when I was comparing the aspartic acid and the glutamate acid, that's just one carbon with two hydrogens were able to change the pKa from 4.5 to 4.0. So if I make a peptide in one study, in another study I make in another peptide, of course this has an effect. And this is what you can see in this paper where they were comparing results from different labs. Example of a peptide that people were using, like I mentioned about alanine, but they, they can also make with the glycine. And depend on the position where you put your titrable amino acid, you are going to see difference in the results. So what table should I use? Well, I would say that it's pretty hard to define one. What I like often, of course, is to use this classical work of Nozaki for maybe for historical reasons. Sometimes we test this to see if there's an impact in our results. Or if I have a choice, of course, I, I like this new study here because at least they put something that for me is very important. They could quantify the standard deviations. So it's the first paper that people were measuring these PKAs and you can see that there are errors. They try to estimate what's experimental error. So this is something that for me helps a lot. So you can see what number makes more sense. But often, uh, you can see that people just use the Nozaki data and that's it. But it's good for you to know that there are different sorts of experimental things. And the numbers, that if sometimes when you're, do, when you're doing your calculation, you end up into trouble to reproduce some experimental quantity. And the simple reason is that you are using a data that eventually is not ideal for that system. Okay, I'm, I talked a little bit about this basic chemistry. I, now I talked a little bit about the, the, the PKAs that you can get in terms of results. But let's continue to be talking about how to measure electrostatic properties. The, let's say the general ways that people do the experiment, the techniques at least. This is a meeting that happened about 20 years ago. And this was actually the, the, the poster of the meeting. There were discussions who could be more primitive if us that are trying to understand the titration plot. Actually, there were jokes, even sometimes more, I would say, unpolite jokes. But the reason that people use this, uh, the real reason that the organizers of this meeting used this, uh, this kind of uh, image was to show that our knowledge about electrostatic interactions is still very primitive. I showed you the confusion between the experimental results, the paper where people were making estimation about the, the errors in the ERPK measurements from 2006, and the preliminary data was from, from the 30s. So it took like 40 years for people to realize that it was important at least to start to quantify quantifying these things. Uh, also, in terms of theoretic approach, so we still have troubles to be able to sample bigger systems long enough in terms of a, a molecular dynamic simulation that we, we can have really convergency for the electrostatic pr properties when we're dealing with a constant PA methods. So although 20 years more or less has passed, we still have some issues and open opportunities in this field. The main techniques I was mentioning, of course, you have the classical more, uh, uh, let's say, common way, that's the potential titration, potential magnetic titration, and several spectroscopic techniques that you can use in terms of the experiments. NMR is probably the technique that most of the labs are using nowadays to quantify PKAs, although a colleague of mine uh, that's doing this kind of measurements 
was telling me that it's very painful. He spent lots of time in trying to understand the signals and to get the results. So from the theoretical side, very often would like the experimentalist to measure something specifically to us and depend on how, how many titrable groups you have in your system, uh, you can lose a friend. So, but anyway, these are the, let's say, the, the name of the techniques at least that uh, can be used for, to, to quantify such things. Focus much more on the theoretical side and trying to tell you a little bit the history. Again, I go back to the Lindy Strong paper. This is his classical paper on the protein ionization, which was published in Danish at the Kausberg Journal. And of course, I don't expect anybody to read. I, I don't, I'm not able to read myself all the details of this paper. Uh, but it's like it's the first theoretical study where there was a model for protein ionization. So this is really a classical one. And I tried here to put, in my view at least, the main important theoretical landmarks in this field. Uh, you have this classical paper, then you have the mathematical or the, the mathematical physics uh, uh, equations or the basis that let them propose later the term for the Kirkwood model a couple of years later. I mean, 20 years later, uh, they, 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 pop, they, they published this paper. Here is the first Poisson Boltzmann study of a regular object. Up to this point, they were treating proteins as a spherical objects. Here, they introduced the positions, but it's still inside a spherical object. Here, they start dealing with a protein as a regular shape, so something more realistic. And it's the first time that Poisson Boltzmann was used to study uh, a, a protein system. The first time that Monte Carlo was used for the same system was here. In 97, it was, for the first time, the coupling between the, the titration study with molecular dynamics. It's this paper from Antonio Batista and some guys from, from Norway. So it was a Portuguese and Norwegian collaboration that ended up, in the first time, for the first time, as a constant pH MD method. Uh, and, you, of course, we start also to have more empirical, more, I would say, uh, more statistical-based or more bioinformatic approaches to also estimate PKAs. So this is, in my view, uh, the, 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 the most important points. So back to what I also showed you, if you have a, a real system, how you can make models, uh, I can also continue here, model as the same line that Eduardo mentioned this morning, that we can go here to a more phenomenological approach and have things like Poisson Boltzmann or even a so-called GB approach, okay? The, the, the born approach, that's something that people have been using as well. So this is just to try to highlight that often when we are dealing with electrostats, there is a tendency for people, even uh, if you are doing uh, constant pH methods, to focus a little bit in continuum descriptions. Uh, I'll try just to remind a few things that I, I mentioned very briefly yesterday, and since I, I have used it again this slide, to try to make this difference between the theoretical approach and the, the simulation approach for the same model. Because yesterday I mentioned this, and I think uh, I, there were people that were asking me, and I think it's going to be good to, 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 to bring this again. And this can be a good point so I don't lose too much of the flow of the lecture. Uh, if I may work you know, with this description, more atomistic description, so here like I have added all the details, and I have a model for my, my solvent. So my solvent is not just a medium. It's not a dielectric constant but it's in fact a particle. It has the shape of a particle, it can be this Mickey Mouse shape or it can be just a dipole moment. So to simplify things, let's assume that instead of having this Mickey Mouse, I have just a particle that has a dipole. This is what they call the dipole or hard spherical model for, for solvent. And if I assume this model, so I have two choices now. How am I going to solve? I can go to the exact solution and perform either a Monte Carlo or molecular dynamics. So this is what I was trying to say yesterday. Or I can make approximations in the mod and invoke my statistical mechanical approach and I'm going to end up in a theoretical analytical approach like the MSCA theory. This is what I was trying to illustrate yesterday in a more concrete basis. Uh, another example that's more related to what we're going to be doing next is if I'm working this continued description. So if I have a continued description, we can work with the primitive model for the lateral light solution. What's the so-called primitive model? Oh, 
by the name you probably can guess. Essentially, you have a collection of hard spheres, and you put charge on it. So they, they interact through Coulomb interactions in a medium. That, so you assume uh, a dielectric constant for this medium, and they cannot have the Coulomb, I mean, they cannot overlap each other to avoid the Coulombic collapse. I mean, if you, if you put the two charges on the top of the other, their distance is going to be zero, and you're going to have even a mathematical problem. So essentially, that's what's done. I mean, you define a size of your particles, you put charge, and that's it. So this is what we call the primitive model. If you have the primitive model and you start trying to solve this model, if you go to the simulations, you are going to let it simulate and eventually measure chemical potentials, radio distribution functions like I, I showed you yesterday, these kind of things. But if you go to the analytical side, then depend on the level of approximation that you invoke, you can end up in different results. One thing that Eduardo showed this morning is like, okay, for the same model, I can invoke the Poisson-Boltzmann approach. And if I assume that I also have a linearization, I'm going to end up in the so-called the by hook approach. But there are other theories that can do something equivalent. Sometimes you solve the problems in one, you put another one. I mean, there, I'm not, of course, I'm not going to go into all the details, but it's good for you to know that these theories they exist and there are alternatives. Uh, all the time that you are going in this way, you are going to assume for sure approximations. What we have to understand is when it's valid to, to work under these conditions. So it's not like the approximations are, are bad or good, but it's important for you to understand when they can be applied, when, when, when that kind of approximation makes sense and the results you can be used for something. Okay? So that's what I would like to, to stress based on the questions that I got after the talk, and I hope now I could clarify what you, you were not really uh, totally sure what I had in mind. Uh, in fact, one thing that I'm going to show in a couple of slides, uh, maybe not today, but anyway, next, next uh, class on Friday, or Friday, no, Saturday, uh, is to show you uh, when this can, can be, under which conditions for proteins that can be valid these approximations, especially compared with Monte Carlo simulations. Okay? So, to, to put this in the perspective, this is also the picture that I showed you yesterday, the level of approximation that you can have when you specify the solvent, uh, the level of approximation when you specify your protein, using PDB, for instance, just use it something similar to the term for the model, but also we can introduce here another direction in this map, and I can define what level I'm going to, to work with the salt because I can work with salt as explicit particles, but I can also just show me uh, the by hook approach and, and just use a screening parameter. So this is also, uh, going this direction, we're going closer to what you usually we do in analytical description like Roth was using yesterday, okay? So uh, uh, I think this is a good moment to, to make this kind of uh, warning to you. Uh, I like very much this phrase that Peter Steinbach has written a couple of years ago that we should be careful that simulations are all the time something that's not reality. And we have a tendency to believe that simulations are reality. No, we are testing what we are putting in our model, point. If the model is good and you're not invoking astro approximation and your sample is good enough, eventually this can mean something. We have to be very careful because very often I can see, especially the beginners, uh, believing that what they are measuring is the, a fantastic thing. They have solved all the problems because they got from the computer. Yeah, I can got anything depending on what I put. And if it makes sense or not, depends on in our interpretation. So watch your step when you're doing such things. Uh, I was mentioned this difference between explicit and implicit model. So before I finish, uh, uh, at least this part, I would like also to make some comparison, and I'm taking some slides from people that are working in this field, and uh, not like Nathan Baker, for the comparison between explicit solvent and implicit solvent. Again, there are good points and there are bad points. He's listing here the obvious things. I mean, when you were working in atomistic description, you were trying to put much more details in your system. You were trying to introduce uh, information that you'd like to explicitly take into account adding these additional degrees of freedom. This, of course, is going to increase your costs because you have more interactions to calculate. So usually you have a slow and eventually you're not sure about the convergency. It's difficult to have good scaling. You have to deal with the boundaries. 
you have to be sure oops, you have to be sure that your first fields are working and I'm going to show you a result uh, in two three slides that you can be you can start to make questions about what kind of first field you had uh, but anyway it's good to keep this in mind that like there are points that can be important for you if you'd like to study for instance hydration you cannot work in the implicit word you need to work with this place but talking about uh, the comparison between things. I mean, that often we believe that the atomistic approach is the best one. I like very much this, this paper from Hess, uh, where he was trying to compare different water models. So now we are forgetting about the protein. We're just lo looking to the simulation of ordinary water. You drink water, uh, and we have lots of difficulty to reproduce some properties of water. You can see here the classical water models that are available in most of these packets that he was asking me. And you can see how difficult it is to reproduce the experimental dialectic constant of water. So here you can see a set of uh, simulation results for these different models. And it's very hard to come closer to 78. So if you'd like to, I mean, if you'd like to be realistic, and for you electrostatic interactions are really important, if you were screening by a different factor in practice, your interactions, are you sure that you were putting a good description of the electrostatic interactions? Because this can be a problem. I mean, you are reducing a lot, a little bit more, I mean, for instance, here, or you're reducing less your, reduc your, your attractions. Of course, eventually in the parameterization process, you found a way to compensate. But it's important to know that it's not always clear, at least, when you put all the details, if you were gain what you're explaining, I mean, you're expecting to gain. Here's a good example. Uh, I also like to show you the difference between small changes in the force field, in the parameters, that can affect a lot of the results. I mean, comparing, for instance, SPC with SPCE, in this case, the dialectic constant was 66, here 71. You can see that the Van der Waals contributions are exactly the same, and a very small difference in the charges is enough to give it this small, I mean, this difference. I mean, not that small, but it's still, I mean, not big, but anyway, but anyway a, medium, uh, a medium effect in your dialectic constant. But we are talking about something that happens in the second digit of this number. So this is some ways telling you how sensitive the charges can be when you are making your parameterization. Just to don't, um, for you to don't feel frustrated, there are new models coming out. I mean, Ken Dew has a good model now that's finally able to reproduce the experimental dialectic constant of water. So at least now we have someone that's able to measure. Uh, it's not clear if all the other properties of water are going to be well when you use these parameters, but at least for the dialectic constant, there is a model that can be used. Uh, I mentioned that we can be surprised about the difference in force field. And this is one slide that Roland Nets, that was here in one of the previous editions of this school, he gave me where he was comparing the parameters from different force fields. And one thing that you can be surprised, if you look here in this circle here, in the red circle, you can see five, four, and four using different objects. Each of these objects belongs to one type of ion. So the same parameters, the same Leonard Jones parameters are used for different chemicals. So if you were using one force field here, you were working number five, that's the work that they were doing. Uh, for U5 means bromide. For the other guy here, Young, four means chloride. So how can you be sure if the chemistry is properly done in your system if for the same parameter you can, you can be defined different chemicals? So this is another thing for you uh, to think about, and that's actually the question that he, has be, he, he brought into discussion a couple of years ago, if the force fields, they are really rationally designed. And his true answer is that no. So that's, uh, again, back to what I was discussing with you, that you have to be careful when you select the force field. Here, is another example of trouble that you can end up. Uh, I think I was trying here to 
to try to give some tips for you how to select the different models. So I listed a couple of questions that you probably can ask yourself to define in which direction you should go. But it's essentially a repetition of what I, I, I did yesterday. So I'm going just to jump these slides and focus a little bit more just to try to clarify a little bit more the details about what I mean by this continuum framework. So instead of having this water model explicitly, we just take this average behavior, then you hide everything, and this is screening parameter here, epsilon. That's also a function of the temperature. So all the time that I specify the dielectric constant, I have to be careful to specify the temperature that I'm working with. So that's the typical approximation. I mean, we, we neglect all the atomic details, all the electrical structures. We make uh, a spheric object, we put a charge on it, and we do the same with the solvent. And instead of we have uh, everything split and moving, we reduce everything to a structureless continued description of this that's going to just screening the interactions as a function is going to do. So this approach, I'm missing the solvent, and as such, I cannot study hydration effects in the same way. But there is really this big reduction in the particles. You can see in this picture a simulation where you have all these splits waters present, and here that you have just the ions and the contra-ions. So it's really a huge saving your CPU time. Just remember that the CPU time goes to the N square. And you can easily see that there's a big gain. Uh, OK, I think this is the point I'd like to stop. Uh, questions? How uh, do the two methods compare? Which methods? OK, um, well, for instance, if I take this constant paid match, that's going to be the topic of the next two classes, uh, and we compare models that we use a continued description with simulations that you have atomic and all the details, we can see that we can reach conversions much earlier. So we are able to simply much better the electrostatic part, like the coupling between the sides that can titrate, then in a simulation that you have more details using equivalent CPU time, equivalent power time. Uh, it's hard to tell you how it's going to be in the future because the computers are getting faster. So there's might, there might be a point that for the systems, the size of the systems that we're studying now, that eventually the atomic <coughs> simulations are going to, to, be, to improve and have a better agreement with experimental data. But for some systems, at least, that have been studying and comparing, we are able to get better results using the continued description than using atomic description. But for the kind of properties that we're also quantifying, I mean, if you're me focus on the electrostatic part, it's true. Eventually, there are other properties that it cannot be true and we didn't test. So everything depends what we are doing. And again, what's their question? What's the level of accuracy that you like? And how's the power, computer power that you have? Okay, I think that's that. I think is really, uh, for me, the honest answer. Okay. Well, if you don't have any questions, I think I have to give the word to Roth, and maybe we can make a three minutes break, right? So thank you, and I, I'm going to continue this part two and part three on Saturday probably and on Sunday morning. Welcome. Thank you.